Pepsi-Cola, P-E-P-S-I. That's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi-Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy. Calling Washington. United States Counter Spies especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the international intrigue. Another counter-spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola hits a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now it's proved. Pepsi's best. Because Pepsi, and only Pepsi, gives you more bounce to the ounce, more real value, and quick food energy ounce for ounce than any other leading cola drink. No other leading cola can say that. Proven highest quality. And homogenized for finer, smoother flavor. More bounce to the ounce. That's Pepsi. Listen later in this program for a sensational special offer. Meanwhile, remember, get more bounce to the ounce. Get delicious ice-cold Pepsi-Cola. And now, to Counter Spy. Early one evening, in the glass and steel railroad terminal in the lovely Swiss city of Lucerne, a train chugged busily to a stop at the platform. Among the crowd waiting at the platform was a tall, swarthy man in a dark gray chauffeur's uniform. Half hidden behind a post, his eyes scanned the faces of the disembarking passengers. As a dignified, gray-haired man stepped from the train, the chauffeur smoothed down his uniform and approached the gray-haired man deferentially. Dr. Brewster, the American scientist? Yes? The car you ordered is over here, sir. Just a few steps. Good, good. Uh... Tell me this cottage up the valley I'm going to. Is it quiet, secluded, well hidden? Oh, yes, Dr. Brewster. Once you are there, you will believe yourself to be in another world. Driver, you're slowing down. Are we near the cottage already? No, Dr. Brewster. But the young lady up ahead on the road seems to be having difficulty with her car. I thought I might see if I could help her. (laughs) Old world courtesy, of course. Of course. Mademoiselle, can I be of some assistance? For starter, something seems to be wrong. Allow me. Everything is going well, Carol. Have you contacted the agents of the nations that might be interested? Yes, Belair. They are eager to see you, particularly that young one, Victor Modesto. And I'll be ready to talk to them in 48 hours. Dr. Bruce and I should have reached an understanding by then. Very well. 48 hours. <laughs> there you are, mademoiselle. It was just a loose bolt. Thank you. I've fixed it now so that nothing can go wrong. <laughs> Karen, as many times as I've been here, I'm, I never cease being amazed. Really, Victor? But to think that this chateau, the most impressive in all Lucerne, in all Switzerland, belongs to such a scoundrel as Belair. If you feel that way, why do business with him? Oh, unfortunately, my profession compels me to deal with swine. Such as I? Uh, you are the exception, Karen. Not be too sure, Victor. Shall we go in? Uh, tell me, what is it Belair has to sell this time? I act only as his messenger. He does not share his secrets with me. What does he share? His leisure hours. Oh, it sounds delightful, Karen. That depends. Ah, Karen, you're brought here. Yes, Belair. Hello, Belair. So formal, Victor. We know each other better than that. I'm afraid we do. Um, uh, Karen. Yes, Belair. 
They are performing a particularly fine ballet at the opera house tonight. I thought we might go there and follow it with a late supper and a little gambling at the casino. As you wish. Then, uh, hadn't you better return to your hotel so you can change and perform whatever mysterious rites you must to keep yourself so attractive? Oh, of course. Goodbye, Monsieur Modesto. Uh, I may see you at the casino later, Karen. Come, Victor, my study. It is the only place in this chateau I permit business to be transacted. Uh, a moment. I close the doors. Drink, Victor? Brandy? Aquavit? Vodka? Or did you pick up a taste for scotch during your years as diplomatic attaché in the United States? I never drink while on duty, Belair. You have something to sell. What is it? <laughs> that is why I'm so fond of you, Victor. So correct and so direct. ha. <laughs> Why did such a prim young man as you ever enter his country's espionage service? For a reason you would not understand, Belair. Patriotism. I not understand patriotism? Don't be ridiculous, Victor. I make my living from selling secrets to patriots so that they may kill other patriots. It is a matter of honor I prefer not to discuss with one such as you. Ho, ho, ho. So righteous. Get to the point, Belair. Not only do you speak English like an American, but you do business the same way with the same directness. Very well. I offer you a most valuable article. In fact, to your country, to any country, it is priceless. Be more specific. I will, when we have talked price. Oh? What did you figure? One million dollars, American. That is the starting price for this knowledge. Starting price? What does that mean? There are other nations besides yours who could use this information, and I'm not particular. You, you are making this offer to others, too. You are the fourth representative of as many nations that I have talked to. Have you no sense of honor, Belair? <laughs> I have a good sense of business. Four possible buyers mean a better price than just one possible buyer would. And uh, that is the lowest price you will consider? Yes. But I'm sure there will be higher ones. So return to the aged diplomats at your embassy. Let their watery blood run thicker at the thought of what I offer. The secret of American know-how in the field of modern miracles. This information, Belair, is it on film? On paper? What is it? It is imprinted on a human mind. You see, I'm selling not secrets and papers, but a human being. A man. The most experienced atomic scientist in the United States. Clear Channel 12. Clear Channel 12. Channel 12, clear. Use. Counters by headquarters, Washington. Flaherty, Chief of Communications speaking. Code 72, revised. Code 72, revised. Are you ready, Code Division? Go ahead, Flaherty. Go ahead, Q8. To David Harding, Chief of Counter Spies from Archer Codes Division. Here follows decoded message from Switzerland, Q8. Man named Belair, leading espionage operator living in Switzerland, claims to hold American scientists informed all phases of American atomic progress. Belair, acting as agent for scientists to sell his services and knowledge to highest bidder among spy services here. End of message. Thank you, Archer. Dave, that message means big trouble. Maybe, Peter. Maybe, with someone selling us out on our atomic secrets? If they fell into the wrong hands. As long as they're secret, anyone's hands are the wrong hands. Who could that scientist be? I have no idea. But I think this is important enough for you and me to move to the actual point of operation. Switzerland? Call the airfield, Peters, and have our C-54 made ready for transatlantic flight and take care of all the necessary clearance routine. Right, Dad. Uh, not so fast, Peters. Oh? Sorry. Right. We'll be operating in alien territory without our usual facilities. You better have one of our portable laboratories transferred to the plane. Flying lab, good idea. Now you can put on speed, Peters. Right, I'll call you as soon as everything's set. If I'm not here, try the communication room. I want to get right to the business of ferreting out the identity of that scientist in Switzerland. Good evening, Karen. Ah, Belair. 
I have known you only four months, my dear, but you continually amaze me. Good. You grow lovelier each day. Make me wonder more about your life before we met. Uh, Valer, did you finish your business with Victor this afternoon? Yes. He made an attractive offer. How does fortune favor you at the gambling tables tonight? She smiled pleasingly since I have adopted this charming gentleman as a lucky thief. Oh? Valer, let me present Monsieur Fulda. Fulda? I've heard that name, monsieur. And I the name of Belair. <laughs> it is not strange, since we are in allied fields. But it is strange we have never met before. I have dealt with representatives of your government. Yes, they submit very flattering reports on you. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, am I to be completely ignored? Oh, Karen, I am sorry. But it is not every evening one meets such a notable foreign agent as Monsieur Fulda. I return the compliment, Belair. <laughs> um... You will be here in Lucerne for some time, Paul? Oh, quite some time. Lisbon, where I've been until now, is not quite the beehive of information it once was. Uh, you may find Lucerne has taken its place. Gentlemen, this was to be an evening of pleasure. I am sorry, my dear. I apologize to you, Karen. However, if Belair has something of interest to me, perhaps we can arrange an appointment. I was just going to suggest that. You will bring your credentials? Naturally. Then uh, come to my chateau tomorrow at four. Where is your chateau, Belair? I will send Karen for you. Ah, my good fortune continues. And I have stopped with all this talk. Can we return to the table? With pleasure, my dear. Some success at gambling might well be a forecast of larger stakes yet to be won. How are we doing on time, Peters? Pretty good, Dave. If the weather holds, we should be in the sun by early evening. Conway in Washington to C-54H. Conway to C-54H. Washington calling H. Yes, I'll take it. C-54H to Washington, receiving clear. Go ahead, Conway. We've checked passport records, Mr. Harding. Five atomic scientists have European travel permits. What countries are they in now? Sweden, France, Switzerland, and Italy. I've wired the counter-spy attachés in the various cities to verify their presence. Good. Radio photo us complete identification on the men involved. That's all. Peters, let's see if we can raise Agent Q8 in Switzerland on the code transmitter, so our arrival won't be too unexpected. We may get more news of the man Belair. My chateau, attractive, Monsieur Fuldo? Very much so, Monsieur Belair. Uh -huh. uh, but to business. These offers you've had from other nations, what is the highest? Two and a half million, Fuldo. But I want more. Shall we say uh, $250,000 more? Fuldo, let's not quibble over a quarter of a million dollars. There's only the money of the taxpayers of your nation. Let's say a round sum. Three million dollars. Of course, I would first have to know who the atomic scientist is and have material proof that you can deliver him. Naturally. And if he is not as important as you say, I withdraw the offer. The gentleman of whom I speak is Dr. Simon Brewster. Brewster? In some respects, the foremost atomic research physicist in all America. Uh, it's incredible. It's unbelievable. Why should Dr. Brewster betray his country? Men betray only institutions that have been unjust to them. Dr. Brewster feels the injustice of the rewards he received from the United States. And have you material proof I can submit to my government? You shall see him this evening. Uh, from a distance. He does not wish to be bothered until the transaction is complete. My eyes could be deceived. <laughs> you shall have his fingerprints. They could be obtained fraudulently in many ways. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not dealing with a fool. The final identification will be a plaster cast of his teeth. You can compare that with a dental chart. Ah, where would I get such a shot? Surely your agents in America could obtain that it. That would take time, Billy. I'm in no hurry. Neither is the Dr. Brewster. He withdrew from the atomic project a few months ago. He's enjoying his rest. What about that glimpse of him you promised me? He's at a cottage in the mountains. He can leave immediately. Good. A uh, folder. I'm afraid I must be melodramatic and ask you to submit to a blindfold as we approach the cut. I understand. All right. Monsieur Belair. Ah, Victor. 
Back into that room. Was this a polite way to come calling at my chateau? With a gun in your hands? You too, monsieur. Certainly. Victor, you will give my guest a bad impression of my friends. Belair, I want to know the name of the scientist we talk about. The price you offered was not high enough, this gentleman's watch. You take my price for my bullet. I do not bargain for my country's welfare. Now, how can one do business on such a basis? You see what I must put up with, Fuller? A gun can be very persuasive, Belair. But such evidence of bad faith. Uh, Victor, I think you better drop your gun, or Karen will shoot you in the back through the door from the garden behind you. <sighs> that trick would not fool a child. It is not a trick, Victor, and you are not a child. What? Drop it. You better let me go, my lad. Let me go. <laughs> you see, Folda? These patriotic fools. Always violent. I see something else, too. Mademoiselle Karen is much more than decorative. Much more. Shall we go? What about Victor? When he regains consciousness, Karen, slap him on the wrist and send him on his way. He will undoubtedly kill himself for failing in his duty to his country, unless he has more sense than I give him credit for. Once again, Fulda, shall we go? Listen to an amazing special offer. Think of it. A genuine super speed candid style snapshot camera that takes wonderful clear sharp pictures for only 50 cents and one bottle top from Pepsi-Cola. Did you ever hear anything so amazing? Here's what a high quality camera it is. Genuine Plano convex double element lens. Beautiful black plastic case. Take 16 pictures, not just eight. On every reel of film. Standard size film that you can get at your nearby camera store. Pictures are one and one quarter inches by one and five eighths inches. So clear you can have them enlarged. Instant eye-level viewfinder. Instantaneous 125th of a second speed shutter. Needs no adjustment. Just the thing to take to the beach with a carton of Pepsi-Cola. In fact, this is such a wonderful camera, it's guaranteed for one year against mechanical defects. The same type of camera David Harding uses to catch criminals. Now, here's all you do. Send only 50 cents in coin with your name and address, and only one Pepsi-Cola bottle top to Counter Spy Headquarters, Box 12, New York 8, New York. Now, please print your name and address clearly, and be sure to enclose 50 cents. Your camera will be sent to you postpaid, but don't delay. This offer will not last. Send for your camera now, tonight. I'll repeat that address later. And now, back to Counter Spy. On a small side street in Lucerne, Switzerland, counter-spy Harry Peters stops at the doorway of a watchmaker's shop. He looks at the window display briefly, glances up and down the street, and then, certain that no one has followed him, he enters the shop. It's quite a collection of clocks you've got here. I only wish they were mine. The shopkeeper has stepped out for a moment. Oh? Okay, Peters, it's safe to talk. You sure? Mr. Fulda? Positive, and skip the Fulda. Okay, Mallory. Though you do that accent wonderfully. In practice. The chief's in Switzerland? Yes. He's staying undercover, living in the plane out at the airport. It's a good idea. This town's a hotbed of spies. Someone be sure to recognize him. That's why he wants fast action on this case, Mallory. Well, he's got it. Belair's got hold of something really big. He told you? Yes, believing me to be the real Fulda. I know it's risky, but I'd like to report to Mr. Harding direct. That big? Yep. Okay, Mallory. You leave this shop first. I'll cover you. If you're clear, I'll give you a high sign and head for the plane. You can meet us there. Harding's waiting. Mr. Harding? Yes. Oh, hello, Mallory. Good to see you. Hello, Mr. Harding. Peter says you're getting action. Too much. 
You mean Belair suspects you? On the contrary, posing as Fulda, I've made a deal for the scientist involved, $3 million. Who is he? Dr. Simon Brewster. Brewster? You're kidding. I've seen him. You talked to him? No. Belair only let me see him from a distance. He's hiding in a cottage in the mountains. I was blindfolded and taken there. Brewster, a traitor? I can't believe it. You saw him from a little distance, M. Mallory. It could have been an imposter. It must have been. I doubt it. Here are his fingerprints. I made Belair get them on this sheet of paper I gave him. And one thing more. This dental cast to check against Brewster's chart. My agents are supposed to obtain it from America. Yes, we've got it. A radio photo. Peter, check this right away in the laboratory compartment of the plane. Well, Peter? No doubt about it, Dave. The prints and the dental chart check exactly. Then it is Brewster. What do we do now? Well, there's one point in our favor. Brewster's been off the project for quite a while now, and a lot of new progress has been made. But still, I'd rather gamble $3 million than the atomic information Brewster does have. I might be able to locate that cottage, Mr. Hardy. No. No, Mallory, that's too much of a chance to take. No, instead, contact Belair again tomorrow. Make final arrangements to complete the deed. I'll see that the money's transmitted to you from our export bank. Dave, why don't we at least try to find that cottage? No. No, we'll cover Mallory on the money. Because I want him to get Brewster actually into his possession. If there's a slip-up, I'd rather lose the money than the man. Okay, Mr. Harding, I'll take the money to Belair and his chateau right away. Well, Belair, is my part of the bargain satisfactory? Perfectly, Fuller. I haven't realized how big a package the money would make, even in large denominations. And now, Dr. Booster. Of course. I have him right here for you. Come. This is Dr. Brewster. You do? Shall we go, Dr. Brewster? Yes. A drink first, gentlemen. To celebrate a most profitable transaction for all. Uh, not but... I insist. Very well. You're helpful, huh? Thank you. And yours too, Dr. Brewster. Thank you. Uh, hold on. Yes? I am Dr. Brewster's banker. If any attempt should be made to regain this money, part his, part mine, he will lose his power of speech as far as atomic information is concerned. Correct, Dr. Brewster? Yes. Come along, Dr. Brewster. I want to get you into the jurisdiction of my government as soon as possible. Goodbye, Billy. Goodbye, Fuldo. Karen! Karen, are you upstairs? Yes, Billy. Then pack up quickly. You must move fast. We're going to take a vacation. A very long one. Worth three million dollars. <laughs> Sit down, Dr. Brewster. I... I don't understand, Mr. Fulder. This plane isn't even warming up. There's someone I want you to meet. All right, Chief. Hello, Dr. Brewster. Hello. Don't tell me you've forgotten me. Why, no, you're... you're uh... <coughs> What's the matter? Hold him, Alice. <coughs> Sam Hill. His pulse, Mallory. Feel it. Right. He's dead. What's the matter, David? I've heard a scuffle. Brewster's dead of a heart seizure. Brewster? I wouldn't bet on that. What? This man is not Dr. Simon Brewster. Look at him closely. The features are generally the same, but here. Along the chin and the side of the nose. Faint scar tissue. See? Plastic surgery. An imposter, as we thought. Yeah, but the fingerprints, the dental chart, you checked them. They were Brewster's. What's happened to him? I'm afraid of the answer to that question. We can get it out of Belair. I think you're right, Peters. It's time we came out in the open. Mallory, you will come with me to Belair Chateau. Right. And Peters? Yes? We'll take the pilot and the co-pilot along for additional support. You'll cover us from outside. Let's get going. Oh, 
Rhoda. Yes, Claire. Where's Belair? Why, I do not... All right, Claire. Another minute, Mr. Companion. Oh. Come in, gentlemen. Ah, why the gun, Belair? You seem angry, Fulton. You bring strangers to my house. I think it's advisable to have a gun. Very discreet, particularly since I came to take back the money I paid you. With this other gentleman to assist you? Yes. Why? Dr. Simon Brewster is dead. How unfortunate. But, Fulton, I kept my part of the bargain. I delivered them to you. I want that money, Belair. My country cannot afford to waste dollars. Ridiculous. Your country wastes more than any other in the world, doesn't it? Mr. David Harding. What do you mean? Don't be foolish, Fulda, whatever your real name is. It's Mallory, Belair. Thank you, Mr. Harding. Do you think that I, a dealer in espionage, would not recognize the head of the largest counter-spy organization in the world? Karen. Yes, Belair? Relieve them of any weapons they may be carrying. Certainly. So, I was dealing with the United States all the time, Mr. Hardy. You didn't suspect it, did you? I give this agent of yours credit. He was very clever to assume the identity of a known spy. What about Dr. Brewster? Of course, you soon realized the man I delivered was an imposter. A fool I hired to impersonate the doctor. But the real doctor? Like the fake one. He's dead, too. Can you prove that, Belair? <laughs> That's how I got his dental cast and fingerprints. I thought I could persuade him to talk. Unfortunately, his heart was not as strong as his conviction. You're lucky with heart trouble, aren't you? You mean the gentleman who died on your hands? That wasn't heart trouble, Mallory. Definitely not. It was poison. The drink he took before you left for the... Um, Mallory. Now, Mr. Harding, I have no doubt you have other agents outside, but I, too, have an ace. There are many exits from the chateau. I shall leave by one. And leave you two here. Dead. Your first shot will bring our men in. And you're not going to fire it, Belair. I have a trump ace to play yet. The agent who informed me of this in the first place. Oh? All right, Belair, drop your gun. Karen! Drop it, Belair. That's right, Belair. Meet Miss Karen Delphus, counter-spy, my trump ace. But a dead one. You all right, Karen? I'm okay, Mr. Harding. He missed by just a knock. I didn't think he'd try that, Mr. Harding. Uh, just as well. It'll save a lot of explanation all around. Hey, Peter. It's all right, Peter. Everything's under control. Who's the door? An agent you haven't met. Meet Karen Delphus. Code name Q8. Glad to meet you at last, Mr. Peter. Glad to meet you. Mallory, stay here with the body. Call the Swiss police. I want to report everything to Washington. Peters, you can escort Karen to her hotel. She'll probably fly back home with us. It'll be a pleasure, Dave. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm afraid of. Let's go. Now, everybody, act immediately. Send only 50 cents. With your name and address clearly printed and only one Pepsi-Cola bottle top for a genuine, candid-style camera. Send to Counterspy Headquarters, Box 12, New York 8, New York. And remember... Pepsi-Cola, it's a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday. Same time, same station to Counterspy. Listen next Tuesday for the exciting Counterspy case of the beefy buyer. Millions in merchandise vanished into thin air. A master criminal with one tiny failing and a weakling who turned strong in the face of death. These were some of the memorable facts in an action-packed investigation we're going to dramatize next week. Be sure to be listening for... Case of the Beefy Buyer on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York was directed by Mark B. Loeb, dramatized by Palmer Thompson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer, with music by Jesse Crawford. Bob Shepard speaking. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production for Pepsi-Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. (laughs) 